I'm so glad you guys are here. I want to just uh, take a second just honor everybody that's even watching online. Man, we love you guys. I know you may be watching uh, from the area or around. Uh, and if you are in the area, I'm going to encourage you. Come on, come be in person with us. We invite you to do that. It's just better being in a room. Come on, help me out, everybody in the room, right? It's just oh, about six of you said it's all right, better in the room. Come on, isn't it better in the room? All right, good. Uh, and so, man, I'm just thankful for you. Anybody that's listening on the podcast, we love you. We honor you. And, uh, man, really excited that you guys are here. We're in week three of a series called Can't Steal My Joy. Somebody shout like you got some joy. Can't steal my joy. That's good. Can't steal my joy. And again, uh, over the last few weeks, hopefully if you were able to get a journal that we had purchased at the beginning or that the the people of Purpose Church had had purchased, this idea of this journal that we're walking through every single day together as we look through the book of Philippians, and it's this guy named Paul, and he's writing, and kind of there's this main theme that's going on uh, when he's writing this book. And it's this main theme is this idea that you and I, no matter what we're walking through, no matter what we may face, no matter what we're dealing with, that you and I can have joy even in the middle of whatever we're going through. That no matter what's going on, the, no matter what you face, that you in the middle of that can still have joy. And Paul is writing this letter uh, to a group of people in Philippi. It's a church that he had planted there. And so again, kind of purpose church and, and, and the church that, that Paul is writing to in Philippi, we kind of got the same thing going. We understand we're church plants. And he's writing back to them about 10 years later. And he's again in encouraging them, hey, you can have joy no matter what. Actually, a lot of theologians say that this is actually the happiest book in the entire Bible, right? And I know we talked about that week one. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Uh, We talked about that. And then last week, what we talked about was that Jesus is the greatest example of joy, that he is the greatest example of what joy would look like and how we should follow the leader, that that's something that we should do. And again, I want us to understand that the reason why this makes it so impactful that he's writing this and saying, hey, you can have joy no matter what is because he's actually writing this from inside of a prison. You got to understand that. Come, like, not because he did anything wrong, but because of the fact that he was preaching the name of Jesus and it's wound him up in jail. Okay, so this is a big deal that he's writing. Hey, no matter what's going on, that you can have joy even in the middle of it. See, one of the most important conversations for us to have right now, if you're anything like me, again, we can turn on the news and there's always something trying to steal our joy. We can get on Facebook and we can scroll through there and there's something always coming after our joy. And I just want to encourage us with this idea that you know what, no matter the circumstance, no matter what's going on, that according to Scripture and according to Paul, that you and I can have joy no matter what. And again, we've been talking through that over the last few weeks together. And again, this is not a series for us to put blinders on, right? That's not what this series is about. This series is not a series where we minimize the things that are going on and happening around the world. And maybe you're experiencing some financial pressure. Maybe you're walking through some anxiety or depression right now. And what I want you to understand is I'm not trying to minimize any of that that you're walking through because these are very real issues. These are very real things that you and I are walking through. But I just believe that we as followers of Jesus have a joy that we can tap into that no matter what is going on around us that we can have a different aspect and a different viewpoint of what we're going through because of who Jesus is and because of what he's done. Amen or oh me, church. All right, I love that. I love that. So I'm going to pray for us and I just pray again that God would just do something incredible to Today, as he speaks to us, as the Holy Spirit would speak to you and I on week three, it can't steal my joy. Uh, Let's pray together, all right? Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for who you are. And we believe that today you're going to get glory in this place. In Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. I got a quick question for you real fast. How many of us, um, uh, how many of y'all ever use reminders? Anybody out there? Anybody ever need a reminder about some things? Actually, I need a reminder of where I put Allie's car keys uh, this morning because she cannot find them because I drove her car last night and she's at the home with four babies right now searching for our car keys. So uh, I- I'm just going to tell you, your boy, I drove, I don't even know what I did with them, okay? And so like, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is happening right now? But uh, I don't know about you, but does anybody ever need reminders? Come on, it's all skate. Wave at me if that's you, all right? 
Yeah, I think all of us need reminders from time to time. Your boy, being a little ADHD, decides to forget things a whole lot, right? I just, I, I misplace stuff. I forget stuff. I forget that I'm supposed to be here at this time. I forget about doing this, and I don't know about you, but I need some reminders up in my life from time to time, right? It's not even a coincidence that the app on, uh, that there is a reminders app on iPhone right now. Where are my iPhone users at in the room? Are all the saved people? Where are all the other people at in the room? I'm just kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. Where all the all Android users at in the room? All right, use okay, good. Y'all usually really loud, and there's like something I feel like I'm always missing like, by not being an Android user. I don't know, really know why, but but even on, on, on all of our phones, there's this idea of these reminders that are sent to us that we can set a reminder to you and I to, to do something. And I think what is happening is that as we dive into scripture this week. That is exactly what Paul is trying to do to you and I when he's telling us and when he's writing to this church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 3. So that's where we're going to be. So if you've got your Bible, awesome. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be in that today. We're going to be kind of skipping all over the place with that. But what I love about it is he starts out in Philippians chapter 3 and he says this in the very first verse. He says this, that whatever happens, somebody say whatever happens. Yeah, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, watch what he says, rejoice in the Lord. See, I think that's actually more than just a reminder. I think that that, that is a promise, actually, that no matter what you may be going through, that no matter what the circumstance may look like, that you may not be able to rejoice in your circumstance, but you can always rejoice in the Lord who is in control of your circumstance. Come on, somebody, right? I believe that with all of my heart. So again, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Watch what he says after that. Continues on. He says, I never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard. I do it to protect your faith is what he ends up saying. The message translation is not a word-for-word paraphrase, but I'm going to read it to us. And it says it like this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. And he says this, and that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry, so here it goes, right? That's kind of what Paul is saying to you and I. Paul understands that it's often the job, honestly, of, of a pastor to remind us of things, some of the same things that we know over and over and over again. See, we're about 180 weeks old as a church, right? About three and a half years old as a church, and I told you... <laughs> Come on, everybody. She found the keys that I left at the house. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, man. Wow. All right. Um, and so, let me, uh, no matter the circumstance, I'm going to have joy. Okay, here we go. Let's, let's talk about it. I love you, Mama. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are about 180 weeks old as a church, and, and I think, again, I, I've shown all my cards. I got, I've shown you everything I got, right? So, uh, so again, a lot of the times what it's going to be for us is reminding you of the things that you already know. Honestly, a lot of times it's going to be, hey, it's reminding you of some things that we've already talked about. The truth is, is that all of us need a constant reminder of what the Bible says about you and I and what it tells us to do. Matthew 7, verse 12 says this, hey, do other, unto others whatever you would like them to do unto you, right? We need reminders of that ever since we're little kids. Matthew chapter 22, 39, love your neighbor as yourself. Ephesians 4, verse 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Colossians chapter 3, another reminder, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive one another who offends you. Remember the Lord who forgave you, so you must forgive others. Romans 8, 1, guess what? There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and 10, God said, uh, saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so no one of us can boast about it. Watch this, for we are God's masterpiece. Some of you need reminding of that, that he created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he had planned for us long ago. Is there anybody thankful that scripture is a great reminder of what God says about you, how he's forgiven you and I because of what Jesus did on the cross? I'm really thankful, and sometimes I need reminded. Sometimes I need to remind myself, and that's the title of today's message if you haven't wrote that down yet, it's remind yourself. Remind yourself. You and I have to remind ourselves. And see, we need to be reminded of truths like what we just read from Scripture. You know why? It's because it's so easy for us to forget. 
Because it's so easy for us to forget. Why is it that we can come and we can, we can be a part of a big gathering together and we can get our faith just, man, just, just man, fired up, ready to go throughout the week and something can happen on Tuesday and it was the very thing that we talked about today on Sunday and yet it's hard for us to remember. Right? I don't know if you ever find yourself in that way. I'm the same exact way. I can preach something to you. I can preach it. And I want you guys to know that I don't have it all together all the time either. And I want you to know that like, like, I can preach to you sometimes. And then there's sometimes I forget exactly what I'm preaching. Right? The, the thing I just walked through with our church with, and I can forget. So I need to be reminded as well. And so I think all of us need to remind ourselves because it's so easy to forget. That's why it's so important to remind ourselves of what the Bible says. See, Paul, and I'll just be honest, as a parent, come on, all the parents in the room, wave at me right now. Come on, that's you. How many of you think, like, reminders are 95% of parenting, right? Like, hey, you need to pick your room up again, right? I told you five minutes ago, go pick your room up. Hey, I, I, I told you, you got to get up every day and you got to brush your teeth. Come on, somebody, because if they didn't, they wouldn't brush them nasty teeth if they don't, even, if they don't be reminded every single day, right? I think parenting is about 95% of reminding everybody what's going on. I think pastoring can sometimes be the same way. Paul says, you know what, hey, like a good pastor and like a good parent, I don't mind reminding you, telling you the same things over and over again. Hey, whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. And what he does is the rest of the chapter, if you're going to read Philippians chapter 3 this week, I would encourage you to do that. He's telling us, hey, here's how you can have this no matter what happens in your life kind of joy. And we're going to walk through three points today. If you're ready for those, say, I'm ready. Amen. All right, here's a couple things I think Paul would tell you and I, that he would share with you and I, that I think if you will write these down again, these may not mean anything to you today, but you could use them on Wednesday. You could use them on Thursday, whatever it might be. But I believe that the Lord is going to speak to you today and to me as well. I want you to remind yourself, number one, I think if Paul could tell us one thing to remind ourselves of, according to what we're going to read in Philippians chapter 3, is you got to remind yourself that there is nothing more important than knowing Jesus. There is nothing more important than knowing Jesus. Right? See, see there's a lot of important things out there. There's a lot of important things that you and I are, are, are dealing with in our life, but there are none more important than knowing Jesus. I want you to see, even as Paul is writing, he writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, He's going to tell us, he's going to show us, hey, there's nobody better than knowing Jesus. Watch what he says. Verse number 7, it says this, I once thought that these things were valuable. So he had a laundry list right before this of things that he thought were valuable. Watch what he says, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. He says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Watch what he says, verse 8, uh, part B, he says, for his sake, I've discarded, I've thrown away everything else, counting it all as garbage. Somebody say garbage. garbage. Yeah, tap your neighbor, say that's garbage. Go ahead, let them know, let them know. There you go. That's good. So, so what I want to stop on is that word garbage right there for a second. Because if you go back to the original Greek word, which I learned this when I worked at Crossings Camps about 14 years ago. I learned this idea of what this word actually meant. It's a Greek word called skubalon. Everybody say skubalon. That's a fun word to say today, right? It's a Greek word, skubalon. And I want you to understand that when Paul says this word, when he's speaking to everybody, you got to understand that it is a strong word. Like, it is a really strong word. I, I like, like, so strong that it would have caught people off guard that he said it, all right? Like, real strong. And so I want everybody to put your thumb up in there like this, all right? And I want everybody to put your other hand on top of it like this. And I want you to do the sign language for, for poop. It goes like this. Okay, all right. I want you to understand that that's the exact word that Paul would use when he's talking about all the things that he had done. It, it's literally poop. It's literally garbage. It's literally animal feces. If you go back to the very uh, uh, essence of the word, it is literally dung. All right, that's a fun word to say. All of that is dung compared to knowing Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's saying all that is garbage. It's, it's, it's crap compared to knowing God. That's what he's saying. That's what it is. And watch what he says. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Isn't that good news for, uh, for us today? That guess what? It's not based on what you and I do. It's not based on our works, but it's through faith in Jesus. 
I'm so thankful for that. For God's way of making us right, he says, with himself depends on faith. See, I want to I know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. See, I want you to understand something about the author of who's writing this. This is a guy named Paul. He is the original, one of the, I call him an OG, right? He's an OG when it comes to planting churches. He planted dozens of churches. He, uh, uh, scholars believe that, that actually Paul was about 60 years old when he wrote the book of Philippians. So he's got some life behind him. He's got some experiences behind him. He is a legend of the faith. And he is writing this letter to these people reminding them, hey, you know what? There's nothing more important than knowing Jesus. There is nothing more important. So us as a church, you know what our number one goal is? Is to connect people to Jesus, right? And then help them live on purpose. They'll never live on purpose until they first connect to Jesus. And so my heart for our community, our heart as a church for our community is that they would be connected to Jesus, that they would know Jesus. And let me share something with you. This is not something elementary, like a beginner level teaching that we kind of graduate from whenever we get a certain age or if we've been a Christian long enough. No, no, no. You need to understand that this is the gospel. That the gospel is something that you and I should never graduate from. And there's nothing more important than connecting to Jesus and knowing Jesus. Come on, if we believe that, can we give him a big shout of praise in this place? I believe that. And I want you to know this word, even if you go back and you, you, you this word know, it's a very intimate word. If you would study this word a little bit further on, some words, it's the exact same word that's actually used to describe the relationship that Adam and Eve had when Adam knew Eve and then they had some babies. Okay? So like, like this is, a, this is a, an intimate type of knowing. It's not just a head knowledge. Like I know what 5 times 3 is. That's 15. It's not that. It is more of a heart knowledge like I know my wife. Right? It's more of, of that. Like We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about behavior modification. We're not talking about a list of do's and don'ts. See, Jesus did not die on the cross for you and I just to be good religious people. He died on the cross so that we could know him, connect to him, have a real, fresh, authentic relationship with him. And guess what? I am a sinner that my sin separated me from God, yet Jesus was so willing to go to the cross. He was willing to do whatever it took that he was willing to die in my spot and in your spots and I don't know about you I'm thankful that we can know Jesus I'm thankful that we can have a relationship with Jesus I'm thankful that even though I've messed up even though I've been far from God that he was willing to say even in the middle of that I'm willing to go and die for you is there anybody thankful in this place today come on can we give God a big shout of praise come on we could do better than that if we're thankful for the grace of God if we're thankful that he saved us and again, we say it all the time, it's okay to not be okay when you come to church. But guess what? It's just not okay to stay that way. Right? That God is calling you to something more. That God wants more for you than the life that you and I think is okay for us. That God wants something more for you, and he wants to challenge your faith. He wants you to say, hey, I want you to know me, because when you know me, there's nothing better. When you know me, there's nothing that will satisfy you more. When you know me, there's nothing that will appease the appetite on the inside of you that you think everything else might. No, no, no. Nothing will please you and let you know that you are loved and valued like a relationship with Jesus. That's what he's trying to get across to us. That's what Paul's trying to tell you and I. And this is what I want to encourage you with. This, I think if we kind of just sum it down into one little, little cute little phrase together, it's no Jesus, no joy. If you know Jesus, you can know some joy. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're walking through, that you can have a relationship with Jesus. And because of that, you can experience joy that you can't even describe. I believe that with all my heart. Everybody good? Yeah. All right, number two. Somebody shout number two. Here's what Paul, I think, would remind you and I of. You need to remind yourself to forget the past. You need to remind yourself to forget the past. How many of you know that the past has a way of not staying in the past. Come on, somebody, right? Has a way of just coming back in, creeping back in, whatever it might be. And Satan loves to use that a lot of times to thwart your mind, to twist your mind, to get you thinking not things of God, but things of, oh, okay, what can I handle? How can I do it? How can I do it on my own? And I just believe that you and I need to remind ourselves to forget the past. Paul would say that, Philippians 3, verse 12. 
He says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved all of these things. I love that about Paul. He was always learning. He was always growing. He was always saying, God, you can speak to me. You can grow me. You can change me. You can change my preferences. I love that about Paul. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I already have reached perfection because he's saying I haven't. But watch what he says. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ first, Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing. Watch what he says, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. See, what I want to encourage you with, if you want to find some joy up in the season that you're in in your life, when he says the word forgetting the past, he's not, he's not saying to you and I that God's just going to automatically give you spiritual amnesia and be like, whoop, I forgot the last 15 years of my life. Great. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. When he says forgetting the past in the original language, it means to no longer be affected by. That's what it means. To no longer be affected by. So Paul is saying that it is possible for you and I to live our life in such a way that we're no longer affected by our past. And Paul knows this because guess what? Paul had a past. Paul had some things that he had done. Paul had some things about his past. He even shares a little bit of those with us a few uh, verses right before this. This is what he says. Paul says in verse 5, he says, hey, you know what? I, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. That was what the law required. Like, I got that down. I'm good. I was a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. That's like the top dog. That's real good. I was a, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees, which is like the highest, strictest of, of, of schooling and knowing all of that. I knew all that. He said, I was a Pharisee who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. See, what Paul was saying is, you know what? I got a past. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. But just like Paul, a lot of us have a past. We all have things that we did or things that we said that we wish we, none of that, we would have never did or said. Come on, somebody, right? I think all of us have been there. We all uh, have these things that are in the rear view mirror of our life. But what Paul is encouraging us to do is to refuse looking at our life through the rear view mirror and start looking through the windshield of your life because I believe there's more in front of you than there is behind you. And I want you to learn from the past. I don't want you to be stuck in it. Right? I, I, I don't want us to continue to do the same things over and over again that we did back there because it'll never get us there if we keep doing those things back there. All right, so let's grow in that. Let's learn in that. I want us to look through the windshield of life and faith and what is to come. And Paul is encouraging our church that if you want to have some joy, you got to forget the past. And I just want to speak to somebody that walked in here today knowing that you have a past. I want you to understand that you are not defined by your past, that you are not defined by your resume of wins and losses and the record that you have. Don't get stuck on what you did last week, last month, last year, last decade, last century. You are defined by what God says about you. And God says in Romans 8:1 that there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. If you feel shame and regret and condemnation, that's not from God. Pause, let me stop for just a second because some of us may call conviction shame. That's not the same, okay? Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. He's saying, hey, you know me. I know you. You know my word. I wouldn't do that. Do not do that. I'm convicting you. I'm telling you where you shouldn't go and what you shouldn't do because I'm trying to protect you. I'm protecting you from your mouth and what you want to say, you shouldn't say. Right? There's conviction that's going to happen there. That's different than shame that the devil tries to put on you. I want us to understand that. Again, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. That His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin fresh every morning. Is there anybody thankful that the mercies of God begin fresh every single day? We say it a lot around here, but we believe that the best is still ahead. That the best is still out in front of you. That, yeah, you, you, you need to learn from the experiences. I need to learn from my past experiences. But I don't need to live my life looking through the rearview mirror. I need to be looking forward. And I just believe that the best way to destroy today is to regret yesterday. Like, you need to learn from yesterday. You need to say, hey, you know what, God, I did some stupid stuff, Lord. And I want you to teach me through that. Help me grow in that. 
Help me change through that. I don't want to be that person I was. God, I'm going to keep my eyes on you, and I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep going. I think Paul would encourage us with that. Number three, I'm going to land the plane on this. When it comes to this, you need to remind yourself, number three, that this world is not your home. You need to remind yourself that this world is not your home. See, I love Paul when he's talking about this. Philippians 3, verse 14. Y'all can leave that up there for a second. Remind yourself that this world is not your home. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 says this. I press on, again we just read it, to reach the end of the race and receive the, watch this, heavenly prize. The heavenly prize for which God through Christ is calling us. Then he goes on to say this in Philippians chapter 3. Verse 20 and 21, it's what Jake read earlier as he was leading us in worship, as he was leading us through giving and our our, our chance to do that. Like it says this, but we are citizens of heaven. Somebody say citizens of heaven. Yeah, you and I, if you know Jesus, are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly, watch what he says, waiting for him to return as our Savior. And he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. See, I love that so much. I think we read that and we may not understand the context that Paul is trying to share with us in that. This is what Paul is saying. This is a big deal that Paul would say this to the Philippian church. See, when they would have heard this, something inside of them would have clicked for them. See, again, Paul is writing this letter to the people in Philippi, which is actually in this place called Macedonia. And Philippi, like which is in Macedonia, was actually a Roman colony. So their citizenship, even though they lived in Macedonia, their citizenship was in Rome, not Macedonia. So what I want us to understand is, see, I want us to get is that they were living somewhere, but were actually citizens somewhere else. So they were living in Macedonia, but they were actually a Roman citizen. And what that meant was that meaning they could experience the benefits of Rome without ever even having been to Rome before. I think what Paul is trying to get across to you and I and what he's trying to tell you and I is, hey, I know that you may be living in a busted, broken, fallen world, but I need you to remind yourself that this world is not your home and that you are a citizen of heaven, meaning that you and I can experience the benefits of heaven now without ever even being there before. I just believe that with all of my heart. And I, I, as of just a few weeks ago, Allie and I are actual citizens of downtown Murray, pretty much, right? And uh, we got a chance to go to Atlanta this week, a couple days, but we came back. And I'll just tell you, there's nothing like Murray, Kentucky, right? I just love it so much. I, I, I just think this place is, and I believe God is going to do some incredible stuff through us, through other churches that are here. I believe that revival is coming. I believe that we should be, we should be praying for revival. It's what we're going to do on Wednesday night, too. Let's pray that God would send revival. We're going to sing about it. We're going to shout about it. We're going to be about it. But I, as we were pulling in, I just love the, I posted a picture this week of like, oh my goodness, like this landscape as you pull back into Murray. And I remember seeing this, this like landscape. And there's lots of stuff about Murray I love, right? I love Murray State. I, and I know everybody like you ain't, you, you know, you grew up a county over. Like, I don't love it when the students come back. You know what? I love it when the students come back. Some of y'all, some of y'all needs to get some joy about the students coming back, all right? <laughs> like, some of you need that. That's what Logan said the other night at the chamber dinner. Like, some of us need to get some joy about these Murray States. It takes us a little bit longer to get across town. I love it when students are here. I love it. I love the energy they bring to our church. I love, I love, come on, I love the burrito shack. Come on, somebody. I love Murray Burrito Shack. Matt, if you're watching, we love you, and some free queso would be great. All right. I love Burrito Shack. I love lots of stuff about Murray. I love it so much. I love that now we live here, and obviously our church is here. I love everything about Murray. But let me share something with you. Murray, Kentucky is not heaven. And I want you to know that Murray is a great place to live, great place to raise a family, but heaven is going to be way better. Way better. I think about that, and I think about what Scripture says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And it says this, after I saw this vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation, every tribe, people, and language, standing in front of the throne before the Lamb, they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. 
And they were shouting with a great roar. I love that. Why do, why do I want church to be loud? Why do we want church to be a party? Because heaven looks like that. Yeah. It's a great roar. Salvation comes from, from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And he goes on to say in Revelation 21, verse 3, Look, God's home is now among his people. He'll live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He'll wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more coronavirus, no more racism, no more injustice, no more uh, 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 this killing of innocent babies. There's going to be no more of that. All of these things are gone forever. Now just think about that. Remind yourself. If you're a follower of Jesus, and no matter what happens in this world, that you are a citizen of heaven. I don't know about you, I grew up in church, and man, we used to sing songs about heaven. You know what? I love some of them old songs. I don't know if you remember them. I'll fly away. Come on, somebody. Y'all remember that? That... All right, Kyle probably could play that right now. I know he could. Um, I'll fly away. Y'all remember that back in the day? I loved that. I love this. I I don't know if y'all remember the song, In the Sweet By and By. Y'all remember that song? Woo! We're about to have some church up in here together. I've got a mansion. Y'all remember that song? Ooh, boy, somebody like, mmm, going back to it right now, right? Love some of those songs that we used to sing growing up. And there was one song that, that was called This World Is Not My Home. And I don't know if anybody, I asked Kyle today if he'd ever heard it. He's like, no, bro, y'all sang some wild songs. If you watched last week, me and my dad knew one song together. And that was it. Nobody else knew it, just me and dad, all right? <laughs> But, but this world is not my home was a song that we used to sing. And I just want to read the lyrics to you. And I want them to hopefully encourage you a little bit as we sing a song today. Our team's going to lead us through a song. It's not a song you probably know. And I'm going to ask you just to stay seated. We're going to sing through the song in just a second. But I want you to hear the words of this song about singing about heaven, singing about this world. This is a song, The World Is Not My Home. And it said this, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Come on, somebody, right? My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And I I think about the lyrics of that song, and in just a second, our team is going to sing a song called Homeward. And I want you to just let this song be sung over you for a second, because if you know Jesus, just let it speak to you and let it remind you, remind yourself that this world is not your home. It's fallen, broken busted world is not yours in my home if we know Jesus. So team, would you lead us? Y'all let these songs, let this, let this song just speak over you right now.
Cause I know you're faithful And I'm still waiting on a wealth of promises But I know you're able So if ever I stray, if ever I fall Won't you call me and close your eyes all across this room. I want to just love that song so much because I don't know if it spoke to you like it did to me. There's times I've strayed, times that I've fallen. What I love about Jesus so much is that even when I was far from Him, even when I wanted nothing to do with Him, Jesus came and He gave His life for us. I want you to know that your sin and my sin has separated us from God. I want you to know that the things, the choices that we do to not honor God, the things that we do to not honor Him, and that you and I have just been born into that. that this is the nature of who we are as human beings, that we're, we're separated from God. I want you to know that God takes that very seriously. Sin is a serious thing to God. It's so serious that He sent His Son to die for us, even in the middle of that. So the Bible tells us that even while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. Why do you have to die? You're probably asking. You're probably wondering, why would he have to do that? Well, I want you to know that the Bible also tells us that the wages of sin is death. So like the payment for sin, there had to be a, a payment for that. And Jesus became that payment for you and I. And maybe you've never experienced Jesus paying for your sin. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to just extend an offer to you today. That today you can say yes to that forgiveness. That today you can say yes to his grace. Today you can say yes to His mercy. Today you can say yes to knowing Jesus. If that's you and you've never said yes to Jesus, the Bible's very clear on how you and I are saved. The Bible tells us that if you and I would confess our sin before God, we confess that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, that He died on the cross and that He raised from the dead, then you'll be saved, the Bible says in Romans 10. Maybe that's you and you need to give your heart to Jesus today. That's something you need to do. You need to come home. 
I need you to understand that this world is not your home. When you say yes to Jesus, you and I are just like what we sung a little bit, how our old songs used to sing, we're just passing through. That our home is in heaven because of what Jesus has done, not because of what I've earned or what you've earned, but because of who Jesus is. And so maybe you're in here and you need to respond to that invitation today. If that's you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy, but I am going to ask you to just, just, if that's you and you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, would you just repeat something like this? It doesn't have to be word for word, but would you just say something like this? Dear Jesus, would you come in my life? Would you save me? I believe you died on the cross. I believe that they put you in the tomb. And I believe that you got out of the grave. I put my full trust in you today. Save me. Forgive me. Let me live for you from this day forward. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. God, thank you for a purpose that you put on the inside of me. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're watching or you're, you're listening on the podcast or you're in this room. I just want to tell you, if you just prayed to receive Jesus, I want you to know that you just made the best decision that you've ever made in your entire life. That you need to understand this best decision that you'll ever make, that you ever have made, is saying yes to a relationship with Jesus. And we want to be like heaven where there's a great roar that happens. And we want to celebrate you celebrate what Jesus has done in you. So maybe you're in here. I'm not going to ask you to get up and move just yet. I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I am going to ask, if you just prayed to receive Jesus, if you just said yes to a relationship with Christ, would you just slip your hand up and would you drop it right back down? I just want to see you. Would you raise it up and drop it right back down? Awesome. Awesome. Maybe you're watching online. Man, if you if you just said yes to Jesus, hang on for just a few seconds. I'm going to tell you how you can let us know that. I love that. So people raising their hands, people responding online, people responding even as they're listening on the podcast. I want to let you know that we love you, that we're so excited for you. And I just want to let you know if you did raise your hand, why don't you look up here at me? If you did, awesome. Here's my thing for you. I want to let I want you to let somebody know, right? We want you to let somebody know whether it's our team, which we would be honored to know. I want to know that you said yes to Jesus today. Uh, we would love to, to, there's a few ways that you can do that, but I won't let, I, I, you need to tell somebody that you just met Jesus, that you just asked Jesus into your life. You can let us know a few different ways. I will let you know that you can actually, after the end of service, and we dismiss in just a few minutes, up here we got an incredible care and prayer team that would love to just, just celebrate you, love to give you a Bible, a new believer's God, let you know that you are loved, high five you, we're excited for you, and we are here to walk alongside of you in this new relationship that you have with Jesus. And so we would be honored to do that. That's one way you can let us know. Or if you're watching online or you're in the room even or you're listening on the podcast, you can actually text the word PURPOSE, P-U-R-P-O-S-E, to the number 270-229-6488. That lets us know that you made that decision, and we would love to follow up with you this week, love to get in touch with you, love to let you know, hey, we're with you, we're for you, we can't wait to see what God is going to do with you and uh, answer any questions that you might have. And so we love that. We love that.